your goodness for your faithfulness for us. Like the sunshine outside, oh Lord, we have the sunshine in our hearts, oh Lord, today. We praise you, the glory by your name, in our midst, oh Lord. And we invite your holy presence to fill us with your word, with your presence, with your love, with your embrace, oh God. We pray for your messenger that you want to use today. Pastor Terry, we pray that you will you you will enlighten you will enlighten us, oh God, through the words that will come out from his mouth, O oh Lord. And we pray, O oh Lord, that these words, O oh Lord, will, will, will make us, oh God, the person that you want us to be. Thank you, God, and thank you for everything that you're going to do today. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you, O oh God. And we trust to you everything in your caring hands. Be magnified, be glorified in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before the message this morning, uh, let us pray. Lord, help us to have, have minds that are attentive and receptive to your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to be willing to grow and to learn from what you have us here today. Lord, we desire to be in a close relationship with you and to live lives that honor you and by what we say and by what we do. Lord, we know there are difficult challenges that we face. Help us to learn not just through the good times, but also through the very difficult and painful times in life. We ask that you may honor this, your word today, this, your message, as it comes forth through your speaker today. Lord, may you receive all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The message today is entitled, Forgiving is Not Easy. Forgiving is not easy. When we're treated in a bad way, for no fault of our own, it is very hard to forgive. When we suffer for Christ, we are not called to live with revenge, or react with revenge, or judgment, but are called to react with love and forgiveness. Is this easy? No, it is not. Our human reaction when someone does something against us, especially if it is undeserved, is to lash out and to get revenge. To lash out in hatred. We see this in the world today. That the basis of a lot of violence, someone does something to someone, and then that person will do something to the person who did something to them, and bring relatives along, and get the whole clan, or the whole village, or the whole city block, involved in a spiral of violence. It says in 2 Timothy 3.12, in speaking to Christians, to followers of Jesus Christ, it says all who live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Why do I mention that? Because it says the word all. As we faithfully live a life that honors God, we can expect criticism and opposition from those who do not acknowledge God or follow Jesus as their Savior. We will receive opposition and criticism and ridicule, and the question is, are we prepared to forgive? I have seen cases of some Christians who receive criticism because of this, and they react in anger. My question is, is this what the Bible teaches? Is this a valid reaction to react in anger when we are criticized? Especially for our stand for Jesus Christ. There was a child who died in Ravensbrück, the concentration camp, during the Second World War. And they went to the clothing of that child. And within the clothing, they found a piece of paper. And on the piece of paper was written the following. 
O Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill, but also the men and women of ill will. But do not remember all the suffering they have inflicted upon us. Instead, remember the fruits we have borne because of this suffering. Our fellowship, our loyalty to one another, our humility, our courage, our generosity, the greatness of heart that has grown as a result of this trouble. When our persecutors come to be judged by you, let all of these fruits that we have borne be their forgiveness. Isn't that powerful? You would not expect to hear and something of this nature written by someone in a concentration camp being the brunt of all forms of evil. And yet the focus is on forgiveness. The focus is on what has been learned through that time of difficulty. The focus is on love toward those who have persecuted the individuals in this difficult situation. We may say, well, I can't relate because I would never be in that situation. Do not say that. We live in a society that is becoming more antagonistic to the cause of Jesus Christ. And God laid in my heart to preach this today to Christians. Because I can guarantee you are going to face more criticism for your stand for Jesus Christ. And you need to ask yourselves before God, could you forgive those who criticize your stand for Jesus Christ? William Barclay, in the letter to Hebrews, said, There is one eternal principle which will be valid as long as the world lasts. The principle is forgiveness is a costly thing. It is not easy to forgive. It is easier to lash out in revenge and anger than it is to forgive. Human forgiveness is costly. A son or daughter may go wrong. A father or a mother may forgive, but that forgiveness has brought tears. There was a price of a broken heart to pay to forgive that son or daughter who brought grief to a mom or dad. Divine forgiveness is costly. God is love, but God is also holiness. God, least of all, can break the great moral laws in which the universe is built. Sin must have its punishment or the very structure of life disintegrates. And God alone can pay the terrible price that is necessary before men can be forgiven. And he paid that price in the form of Jesus dying on the cross. The ultimate example of forgiveness. Forgiveness is never a case for saying, it's alright, it doesn't matter. Forgiveness is the most costly thing in we have all been hurt by family members, by neighbors, by work, mates, by people we don't even know, road rage, many types of rage today. There are many people who have, who have a lot of anger in them today. And sometimes we may be doing something outside and, and someone may have a bad day and lose control and anger and lash out at us, and we don't even know them, what a test of our relationship to Jesus Christ if we can immediately forgive and not lash out in anger in return. John Trevokas, in his book, How to Keep God Alive from 9 to 5, said, Opaking fluid is the magical liquid that covers over your errors your typos, your unfortunate slip-ups. You brush on the liquid and start all over again. Hopefully this time with no unfortunate slip-ups. Opaking fluid is forgiveness. It's like forgiveness. An obliteration of a goof with no telltale traces that the goof ever happened. 
Forgiveness is brushing over those things that happen to us from the words and actions of others. Because if we dwell on what people have done to us, it forms a root of bitterness within our heart. It's a poison that eats away and robs us of the joy of the Lord. And brings us to the point where the person that we, we react to, we've become like them. In our actions and, and our words. Carl Menninger, the famed psychi psychiatrist, once said that if he could convince the patients in psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, 75% of the patients could walk out the next day. People feeling guilt. Wrongs that I've done to others. God offers forgiveness. Jesus, in Matthew 5 and verse 44, he said, But I tell you, love your Love your enemies. And it, it's easier to love neighbors. Because sometimes we have good neighbors. And sometimes we have neighbors that are, we almost feel like our enemies. So, remember, this is Jesus saying this, right? And he's saying this to his followers. So he would be saying this if he was in front of you right now. True? Love your enemies and, he doesn't stop, pray for those who persecute you. Did Jesus say he would give easy commandments? No. These are tough. This is very tough. Very, very tough. But it's expected of those who follow Jesus Christ. In Romans 12 and verse 14, it says, Bless those who persecute you. That even goes beyond praying for them. It says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That's not easy. That's not easy. No, it's not easy. Jesus did not say that his teachings would be easy. This is tough. Here's a tougher one. Here's a tougher one. Matthew 6 and verse 14. Maybe I'll ask someone if they have that to read it. Matthew chapter 6 verse 14. Or if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Now, did you hear what that says? No. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, that's a precondition. Then, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If we have a root of unforgiveness in our heart, how can we expect to receive forgiveness from God? Part of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 and verse 12, it says, And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Again, Jesus saying, How can we come to, to how can you come to me and ask forgiveness when you are not forgiving others? You might say, Well, that's that's way back in 2,000 years ago. It doesn't apply today. It does apply. I'll give you an example from this year in Egypt. On Palm Sunday of this year, there were two churches that were bombed by members of ISIS in Egypt. And these churches were churches of Egyptian Coptic Christians. They make up about 10% of the population in Egypt. And they've experienced for years and years and years going back beyond what we can conceive, discrimination. Being treated like second class citizens. Encountering discrimination in many forms. Outright persecution. Death. Humiliation. 
churches destroyed. Here is a story that came out of the result of one of those bombings. Twelve seconds of silence, and this is from Christianity Today. Twelve seconds of silence is an awkward eternity on television. Amir Abdim, perhaps the most prominent talk show host in all of Egypt, leaned forward as he searched for a response. He was speechless. And he finally said, the cops of Egypt are made of steel. <coughs> he barely uttered that. Moments earlier, Adam was watching a colleague in a simple home in the city of Alexandra speak with the widow of Nassim Fahim, who was the guard at St. Mark's Cathedral in that city. On Palm Sunday, her husband had redirected a suicide bomber through the perimeter metal detector where the te terrorists detonated the bomb. He was the first likely to die, to have died in the blast. But he saved the lives of dozens of others inside the church. His wife said to the interviewer, I'm not angry at the one who did this. And she said this with her children by her side. I am telling that man, may God forgive you. And we also forgive you. Believe me, we forgive you. You put my husband in a place I couldn't have dreamed of. Stunned, Abdeb stammered about cops bearing atrocities over hundreds of years, but couldn't escape the central scandal. How great is this forgiveness you have? His voice cracked with emotion. If it were my father, I could never say this. But this is their faith and religious conviction. What a testimony to these Christians living and putting into practice forgiveness. We can easily mulch the words of Scripture. We can easily memorize the words of Scripture. But it is tough to put those words in action. When we are faced with a situation, a difficult situation where someone has hurt us deeply, then it's a test of how much we believe these words of Jesus. Words are empty if we don't put those words in practice. Amen? Amen. These are tough. These are tough words. And you may say, well, are there any other places in Scripture where this would apply? And I have a question for you. Where in the New Testament is there an account of a man who is deeply feared and hate hated by the Christian community? Where is an example in the New Testament, a man who was greatly feared and hated by the Christian community because of what he was doing to the Christian community? Paul, who was, before he was Paul, was Saul. 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 Did you ever think, did you ever think of the background story? We hear of Paul's miraculous conversion. We don't hear the background story, which is a, an example of forgiveness. In Acts 8 and verses 1 to 3, we have an account of Paul, who before that was named Saul. And he was holding the coats of men who were stoning to death Stephen. <coughs> a mighty man of God who powerfully preached the word of God and performed miracles. And ticked off the Jewish authorities. Because he was becoming more popular than they were. So they arranged to falsely accuse him and to stone him to death. 
It says in Acts 8, 1 to 3, and Saul approved of their killing him. He approved of it. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul, and listen, Saul began to destroy the church in Jerusalem. Going from host to host, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And some of them would have died there. This is a man who was feared and hated by Christians in Jerusalem because he was destroying through his own efforts, through his zeal, he was destroying the church. Now God had a plan for Saul. And when Saul was going to the city of Damascus to do the same thing to the church there, he didn't make it to Damascus in the same condition. God intervened. Jesus appeared to him in a mighty flash and spoke to Saul, saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus identified with the church. Saul was literally knocked off his, via, his um, um, animal that he was riding on, and he was blinded. And this was not a, an hallucination because the people with him heard the voice. This really happened. Jesus spoke to Saul. Now Saul was blind. Now we get into the backstory. Remember, Paul's hated by the church. The church wouldn't have anything to do, do with Saul, who became Paul, because of fear. We go near this guy, we're going to end up in jail, in prison. God spoke directly to a man of God named Ananias. And he said to Ananias, you are going to go to Saul. Saul's been blinded. I want you to go and lay hands on him and he will receive his sight. Can you imagine what Ananias was thinking? <laughs> You're sending me to the most hated man in Jerusalem by the Christians? The most feared man and you want me to go to him? In Acts 9, 13 to 14, it says, Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name, Damascus. Basically, Ananias is saying, well, Lord, let's reconsider this. <laughs> I don't really feel like going because... What's not being said, Ananias was afraid that he was going to end up in prison too. But this is a matter of obedience. And Ananias, we don't know, but he probably had feelings towards Saul as well because he probably had people he knew who ended up in prison because of Saul. Difficulty forgiving. But he obeyed God and went. He laid hands on Saul, and Saul received his sight and started preaching in the synagogues. But the Jewish people in Damascus didn't like that because Saul was undercutting their authority. So they were going to kill him. So Paul was saved by his followers, and he went back to Jerusalem. Now there's a problem in Jerusalem. People there were not willing to believe or forgive him. It took a brave disciple named Barnabas to prove to them that they were wrong and that God had transformed Saul. In Acts 9, verses 26 to 28, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. They were saying, hey, what's your angle? You're trying to you know, to infiltrate us and learn how many of us are Christians so that you can arrest us, right? That's probably their thinking. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. 
He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved to both freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. The Christians there were able to forgive and accept Saul, who became Paul, one of the greatest apostles in the history of the Christian church. Does that not speak to us? Does that not look at what Saul did? And yet God transformed him. No one is beyond the reach of God, no matter how evil they are. They can be transformed by the power of God. Amen? Amen. But, there are times when people are transformed by the power of God, and Christians still have feelings of anger toward that person, and are not willing to forgive, even though God has forgiven them. True? Yes. This is hard. But, 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 but. We, we have many but, buts. But Lord, he, he or she did this and this. Lord, don't you remember? And they did this and this to me. How can I forgive? Well, God already knows what they did. Because if God didn't, he wouldn't be God. But God is requiring us to walk that difficult road of discipleship. And Jesus has challenged us to forgive. Jesus would say, yes, I know what they did. But you are called to be different than they are. You are called to forgive. Whether that person has been transformed or not, they may still be living opposed to God, but we are to forgive because in the act of forgiveness, we receive release ourselves. We receive healing ourselves in forgiving. It's not justifying what that person has done to us. But through the forgiveness, we receive release and we receive healing. Because when we do not forgive, it is a cancer. It will destroy us over time. So here are examples of Christians who found it difficult to believe Paul had been changed by the power of God. They were afraid and it was difficult for them to forgive and accept the one who had been such an enemy of the church. But they were able, by the power of God, to forgive. So this should be a challenge to us. If they can forgive someone like Saul, can we not forgive that neighbor who's getting underneath our skin? Can we not forgive that person at work who is really bugging us on our back all the time? Can we forgive that family member who doesn't understand about our faith in Christ and is criticizing us? And ridiculing us? Can we really forgive? By the power of God, we can. Not in our own strength. But by the power of God, we can. Now Jesus talked about forgiveness. But he put it in practice. When he hung on the cross, having gone through the most terrible death ever devised, crucifixion, having been humiliated, hanging there naked, <coughs> beaten beyond recognition, he could still say in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. So Jesus not only talked about forgiveness, he put it in practice himself. So the one who talked about forgiveness is talking to those who follow him and saying, my example should be your example. What I have done, I'm calling you to do. No wiggle room in forgiveness. It's tough. When I grew up, I grew up in a home where my, I grew up with a very strong mother. Stronger than my father. And I grew up as a son resenting my mother because of her control in the family. I didn't have any forgiveness toward my own mother. But only after I came to personal faith in Christ was I, was I able to release those feelings of resentment to my mother and forgive her. And come into a deeper relationship with her once that forgiveness had happened. So it is hard 
when we have baggage from our past, from especially from family members that have said or done things intentionally or otherwise that have hurt us. And it's very hard to deal with those feelings of resentment, those feelings of bitterness within our hearts. But we have been called to forgive. As those who follow Jesus Christ, I've said it before and I say it again, we are living in a society that's rejecting God. We're living in a society that is putting man in the place of God. We're living in a society that is self-centered, not God-focused. And I challenge you as people of God, there will be more and more times unless there is a national revival and a transformation of individuals and of this nation. I challenge you, you are going to be challenged if you take a stand for Jesus Christ. You are going to face criticism. You are going to face opposition. You are going to face persecution. And my challenge to you, are you willing to forgive in future when you encounter those who criticize you? Not for anything you've done, but for who you serve. Amen? So I'm challenging you today <coughs> because I believe all of us will face those challenges in future even more. And we need to ask ourselves, can I forgive? But beyond the question, can I forgive, is the question, will I obey Jesus and forgive no matter what I face? Forgiving is not easy. Following Jesus is not easy. But he said, count the cost and follow me. If you're having difficulty today with forgiveness, God can help you deal with it from your past. No one has to know, but God knows. I don't have to know. God speaking to your heart by the Holy Spirit to deal with something from your past where you've had difficulty forgiving. I'm not saying condoning. There's a difference between forgiving and condoning. I'm not saying condoning what was done. Jesus, didn't, Jesus said and mentioned, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He didn't say, Father, it's okay what they're doing. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know, because they're motivated by their own sinful, selfish desires. In the same way, in our past, we have made, may have people who have hurt us. Can we say the same prayer, prayer Father, forgive them, for they don't, don't know what they've done. Father, forgive me. God has spoken to your heart. The Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart that there are areas in your, of your, in your life of people who you have said, I can't forgive them. Which may be true, but by the power of God, you can. And God can give you the strength to come into release in areas of your life where you need to forgive. God has spoken to your heart this morning. We have opportunity to come before him and say, Lord, I release these feelings of resentment and bitterness and hatred toward these people that are like a poison within, and I release them in forgiveness. God spoke in your heart this morning. Obey the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God, not me. But God speaking to your heart. Then you come and we will pray. And now go with the peace of God. Go with the joy of the Lord in your heart. Go with the desire to serve Him and to live lives that honor Him. Day by day, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.